Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, one and all present here. Uh, I am Nidish Kumar, Assistant Professor of Law at Tamil Nadu National Law University. Uh, I happily welcome all of you to this fourth plenary session. The topic for the session is Superstar, Tech Giants and Antitrust, Comparison of US, European Union and India. Uh, we have with us uh, Respector Advocate Vivek Ranjan Pandey as our moderator and the speaker for the session will be Professor Manoj Dalvi. I welcome both of you, sirs. Thank you. I also welcome all the participants. Uh, so before leaving the podium for the moderator, it is my duty to introduce the moderator and the speaker of the session to the gathering. We have with us as moderator today, respected advocate Vivek Ranjan Pandey, advocate at High Court of Madhya Pradesh. Sir was formerly a government advocate at the High Court of Madhya Pradesh. Sir is a research consultant at Dharma Shastra, sorry, Dharam Shastra National Law University, Jabalpur. Sir is a former secretary and founding member of the Indian Association of Law and Economics. Sir is an alumni of course and the Summer Institute for Law and Economics, the University of Chicago. Welcome, sir. Thank to you. Thank you. His, yeah, thank you, sir. To introduce the speaker of the session, we have with us Professor Manoj Talvi. Uh, he is or he has been the professor of finance in the finance department of the Long Island University since 1994. Professor had graduated from the University of Bombay in India, having obtained a degree in commerce and accounting and later in law. He ranked second amongst 3000 students in the law examination conducted by the University of Bombay. Sir so then attained his uh, master's in law from the Harvard Law School, and later he acquired his doctorate from the Columbia University. Uh, Professor's current research focuses on the intersection between law and finance. He is currently working on the market microstructure of the Indian stock exchanges. He has published in journals in the Eastern Economic Journal, Macroeconomics and Finance of Emerging Market Economics. We are so happy to have you here, sir. Welcome to the session. Thank you so much. Uh, now, having accomplished my duty, now I leave the podium for the moderator to take over. Over to you, sir. Welcome, Professor Manoj Dalvi, sir. And we are very happy to have you here. And particularly the subject which you have chosen to speak uh, before us is quite uh, interesting and hot in discussion around the world the big giants big tech giants and uh, antitrust law and that too in the roping you're roping uh, europe america and india uh, we will explore that how you will take up all three together as far as the subject is concerned it is a very it is a very serious subject of concern as we were discussing that uh, american uh, Congress is now coming with a, a bill. They have a bill now. It is to be law on this antitrust controlling these big giants. Those are overpowering the economic power, having three, six trillion, all, all four or six trillion economy they are controlling. So it's quite interesting. I'll not waste my, much of the time of the audience. They are eager to hear you. So please go ahead with your talk. And later on, we will invite the people for deliberation, question, and your answers and the comments. So please, Professor, go ahead with your talk. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, and good evening for to all of you. Uh, can I just begin by sharing my screen, my PowerPoint? Um, yes, yes. Uh, you should be able to press in now, sir. I just granted the privilege. Oh, you just granted me the privilege? Okay. Just one minute.
activities and giving them it. Uh, now that we are on topic, uh, just let me begin uh, by telling you what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, the topic is tech superstars and antitrust, and a comparison of the European antitrust regime, uh, the uh, US antitrust regime, and the Indian antitrust regime. Uh, this is joint work with uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. P.M. Rao. Now, what am I going to do? Uh, there are three antitrust regimes, as I just pointed out. Uh, one is what happens in the US, the US antitrust regime. The second one is the European Union antitrust regime. And the third one is the Indian antitrust regime. And the question that arises is how are these antitrust regulators regulating uh, the tech superstars? And do they have every arsenal in their toolkit? to ensure that these tech superstars do not monopolize and ensure that competition flourishes in the various markets in which they inhibit. Now, marketplaces have existed for time immemorial. Uh, you have, in this slide, you have the marketplaces. One marketplace is uh, a marketplace under a shed uh, where uh, there are buyers and sellers who are selling onions and potatoes. Uh, then uh, you have uh, the picture underneath where it's the, the fish market in Bombay where, they, where there are buyers and sellers and uh, they're selling fish, various different kinds of fish. Uh, these are multi-sided markets. Then uh, you have uh, the modern day market in India, uh, which is a mall in Bombay. Uh, and of course, uh, my favorite is the one on the right where there is, it is a tea stall and uh, the person is selling tea. Now, what is- uh, Professor, Manoj, stores? Professor yeah. Manoj, can we have a short pause? Uh, sorry for interruption. Your PPT is not visible. We need to let you work out, I suppose, because- Oh, wait, I need to share my PPT. Uh, uh, Professor Manoj, if you are finding any difficulties in the same, can you mail no, me the wait, same? Wait, I'll share my, just one minute. I'll share my PPT. Share content. Okay. You have to mail it now, Nitish. No, I, it's done. Now, can you see? Yes. 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 yes Professor. Okay. Uh, so uh, let me go through this again. Uh, you have uh, the, uh, so the first one was uh, the, the picture of the, their tech superstars. Uh, I said what I was going to do. And this is uh, the marketplace. Marketplaces have always existed. Uh, in one case, you have uh, uh, a marketplace under a roof where they are selling onions and potatoes. And uh, in another case, in the picture below, uh, you have a fish market in Bombay where there are multiple buyers and sellers who are selling fish. Uh, then on the right, you have the modern day market, uh, which is known as the mall in Bombay, where there are multiple buyers and multiple sellers. And finally, you have uh, my favorite, the, the tea store. So, Marketplaces in various different forms have always existed, but marketplaces have now also gone digital. Uh, they have gone digital in the form of a platform. And a platform is a place where uh, suppliers of products, services, skills uh, are brought together with the people who want to buy them. And the people who want to buy them can be individuals, uh, governments uh, and various different forms of organization. Now, there is a company 
that runs this, this platform. And it is the platform company that creates the value and appropriates some of that value. Now, both these models, the marketplace, the brick and mortar model and the digital model are supported by ecosystems. Uh, and a classic example of an ecosystem is uh, the app developers for an iPhone or for uh, an Android uh, operating system. But these ecosystems have always existed both for the brick and mortar stores and now for, for the digital stores. Another characteristic of these marketplaces is vertical integration. Uh, in the brick and mortar world, uh, you have integration from the manufacturer to the, to the customer. In the modern world, you also have integration. You have integration uh, from, the, from uh, the hardware to the operating system to the various different apps. Now, what's unique about uh, the digital world and integration in the digital world is that platforms, uh, like, like I pointed out, uh, not only run the run the platform, these companies, these super tech companies, these, uh, these superstars, not only run the platform, but also compete with businesses that depend on them. So the platform, the, the company that runs the platform allows the person to come in and also enters into the horizontal market. So the company controls the access points as well as competes with the businesses that are allowed on the markets. Uh, what distinguishes these digital platforms from the physical platforms uh, are two main factors. One are the network effects. Uh, and a simple example of a network effect is WhatsApp. If there are two users, uh, each user using WhatsApp will not get much value. But as the number of users increases, the value per user also will increase. And this was exactly the reason why when offered to go to Telegram and Signal a few months ago, uh, I did not go to Telegram and Signal because of the value that WhatsApp created for me. And the value that was created was through the direct network effects. Uh, because of the number of my friends, who are using WhatsApp. Then there are also indirect network effects. And the indirect network effects basically arise when there are a large number of uh, sellers, they sell a number of new products. And if the large number of sellers increase, the large number of buyers also increase. Now, these digital markets, the superstars, uh, have a huge database. Uh, a, a, a huge user base. So Apple has a huge user base. Amazon has a huge user base. Google has a huge user base. So network effects is one factor that distinguishes uh, the digital markets and these tech superstars from uh, the physical markets. But what's important? Uh, what's important? is the collection of data. Uh, each of these markets, uh, because they provide an access point, collect huge amounts of data from the users. So for example, if I want to buy a shirt, I can buy a shirt from the physical market, from the brick and mortar market. But if I buy it from Amazon, uh, Amazon, because it grants me access into the marketplace, collects data on the size of my shirt, the color of the shirt that I bought, the credit card used, the maximum dollar amount that I spent, uh, the number of shirts that I saw in, in, my, uh, in my search for shirts, and it collects huge amounts of data. And it uses that data uh, to, to generate power for itself. Now here I have the ecosystems 
and how these three, uh, how these tech superstars work. Just look at Amazon. Amazon has a huge ecosystem, uh, a huge user base. Uh, it has uh, Alexa. Uh, it has Amazon Prime. Uh, it has Amazon Web Services. Uh, you have Google, Gmail, YouTube, uh, Google Drive, uh, a huge database, uh, a huge user base. And then finally, you have Apple. And Apple again has a vast ecosystem. It has uh, tremendous network effects because of the user base, uh, and it has a vast uh, it and it's it has a finger in every pie. Uh, you have Apple Pay, you have Apple Music, and this is the kind of power that has been generated uh, through the uh, through the access points that these companies provide. Uh, and the question is, do these companies use their dominance uh, to stifle competition? Now, if you look at these three companies, uh, and all of them had very, very humble beginnings. Apple started, I think, in 82 or 83, and it's only now that it has gotten so powerful. Uh, Google is a 1997-98 company. Uh, and uh, Amazon also started as a bookseller. And from a bookseller, now it's become a marketplace behemoth. So each of these companies have tremendous market power. And as I've pointed out, they derive their market power because of their gatekeeper status on the platform. They are the gatekeepers. They allow you in or they prevent you from coming in. Uh, there are tremendous network externalities. Uh, there are there are switching costs involved. So I cannot move uh, if I'm locked in into the Apple ecosystem into an Android ecosystem. But finally, what, what generates their power is the data. Because as we all know, data is power. So they use the power generated uh, by the data they collect to keep and maintain their monopoly power. So here you have the tech superstars. Is business, is bigness an issue? Should structure be an issue here? Uh, when regulators regulate these tech behemoths? Or should conduct be an issue? And by conduct, I mean the use of the dominant positions by these various platforms, be by these tech superstars, to bully sellers. And what do I mean by bullying sellers? Now, very often what Amazon does is uh, if I buy a shirt, and coming back to my example, if I buy a shirt on Amazon, uh, there is a vendor, and the vendor can be Mr. X. Uh, Mr. X uh, can either sell the shirt uh, by itself, uh, by, by, by himself or herself, or, um, or can sell the shirt to Amazon, and Amazon will fulfill the order. Now, Amazon can bully the seller to sell the shirt to Amazon at the cheapest possible price. And if the vendor wants to sell the shirt themselves, Amazon can bully the seller into entering into an arrangement, a time arrangement with, uh, with Amazon saying that I will fulfill, Amazon will fulfill the order, and you have to allow us to fulfill the order. Also, uh, there is Amazon can indulge in something called Sherlocking. And Sherlocking is getting into the competing horizontal market, and then because of the treasure trove of data that they have, uh, they can imitate products uh, that sell or are most popular amongst the customers. So for example, if my shirt, which is say of yellow color and of a certain quality is being sold by vendor X and Amazon, because of the data that it has, uh, finds that a large number of shirts 
uh, of yellow color are being sold and of a particular quality are being sold, Amazon can sell that shirt under its own label. So uh, is it bigness? Is it structure? Or again, is it conduct? Uh, which is the crucial element in finding out whether uh, these companies are anti-competitive. Now, the question that I'm going to ask is, are the current antitrust laws uh, sufficient to deal with the issues of the modern day marketplace or the modern day pl platform economy? And uh, what are the remedies? Uh, is the remedy regulating the data collected by big tech? Or is the remedy to break up many of these companies? Now, uh, I have laid out the issue here. And now let us see how uh, these big tech companies are regulated by, by regulators, by antitrust regulators in the US, EU, and India. And let's first go uh, to the state of the law in the United States. And one of the reasons why I'm taking the United States first is because it's the oldest antitrust law. Uh, the antitrust law in the US is governed by the Sherman Act and by the Clayton Act. The Sherman Act was an 1890 Act, and the Clayton Act is a 1914 Act. Now, put together, uh, what these acts say uh, is to prohibit monopolizing or attempting to monopolize, prohibit contracts that restrain trade, prohibit tying arrangements, and prohibit price discrimination. So I'm going to see what applies now to some of the big tech companies. Now, in the United States, the focus in the last about 50, 60 years has always been consumer welfare. Uh, it's to protect the consumer uh, from harms caused by improperly obtained market power. And as Richard Posner pointed out, the only goal of antitrust laws should be to promote economic welfare. And the essential tenets of economic theory should be used to determine the consistency of specific business practices with that goal. So the focus has always been consumer welfare. And the analysis used is the rule of reason analysis. And you break down the rule of reason analysis into four different elements. One is the conduct. The second is definition of a relevant market. The third is what is the market power of that particular business or company. And the last is the causal connection between the two. So that is the state of antitrust law. This is the law in the US. Now the first case that has been handled by the Supreme Court in, of the United States relating to antitrust laws is a decision on what constitutes the relevant market. Because the, the, in, in, in a platform economy in this digital environment. Now, when you buy, when you use a credit, when, when you get a credit card, how, do, how are the credit card companies paid? The credit card companies make their money in one of three ways. It's either subscriptions, uh, but now most of the credit card issuers uh, have no fee uh, credit cards. The second is through the interest charged on overdue balances. And the third is that the merchants you are charged a fee by the credit card. Now the credit cards compete with each other uh, on the fees charged to the merchants. They also compete with each other uh, on the rebates that are given to the customers who use their, who use their credit card. I'm sure you'll, uh, you, you must have heard of uh, double miles or, or some rewards that you get if you use a credit card. Now, American Express instituted no steering rules with its merchants. And what, what do I mean by no steering rules? By no steering rules, I mean that the merchant 
uh, cannot steer a customer to use another credit card by promising a rebate. So, for example, if I go to a merchant and say, hey, look, take this American Express credit card. The merchant cannot tell me, hey, look, I'll give you a 1% rebate if instead of using an American Express credit card, you use a MasterCard or a Visa or, or a Discover card. Now, this creates problems. Uh, the plaintiffs argued that uh, these rules restricted competition uh, and entry by reducing the ability of competing credit card issuers uh, to increase sales by charging lower fees to merchants. American Express said, look, uh, I know we know that we charge higher, higher fees, uh, but uh, these fees are used to, uh, to give rebates uh, to the users of our credit cards. Now the question, and this is what I want to focus on, is in this era of digital markets, what is the relevant market? Is the relevant market the market for credit card services, or is the market uh, for uh, for credit card transactions? I just want to go directly to what the Supreme Court held. And this is an interesting holding uh, by the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court held that the market is the simultaneous transaction between the participants. So this is a two-sided two transaction platform. And the market that needs to be considered is, the two, is a simultaneous transaction between the participants and the relevant market should be uh, should include both the merchant side and the customer side, and they, their analysis included indirect network effects, basically arguing that if prices are increased on one side, uh, the customers will reduce on the other side. The question now arises: Is this holding does it apply to super tech antitrust giants? Because is a transaction with American Ex with Amazon a simultaneous transaction? Uh, is a transaction with Google a simultaneous transaction for it to form a relevant market? I'll give you an example where this uh, this language can apply very easily. Uh, when you take a Uber in Bombay, uh, that's a simultaneous transaction. Uh, if you order from Zomato, for example. It's a simultaneous transaction between the restaurant and you who are ordering the food. So there is a serious question as to whether this will this this case is going to apply to to big tech. The second case is when you purchase from a, a tech company. Uh, are you actually purchasing from the seller, or are you purchasing from the tech company itself? Are you purchasing from somebody who's selling an app or are you purchasing it, the app from Apple? And that case was the Apple v. Pepper case. Now, what Apple does is it provides uh, access to the operating system through something called APIs. APIs are the application programming interfaces. And in simple language, what an application programming interface is, is that if you go to a restaurant, uh, there is an intermediation, an intermediary between you who's sitting at the dining table and the kitchen. And that, interme that intermediary is the waiter. So the application programming interface is the interface between the operating system and the app. Now, what Apple does is it provides access to the operating system through the application programming interfaces. Now, Apple requires developers to pay a 30% commission. Now, what the plaintiff said, uh, Pepper, that this fee gets passed on to the, to the users, and because they are locked in into the, uh, into the Apple ecosystem, there is no other place to buy their apps. Now, what the Supreme Court in the United States held is 
that there is no intermediary in the distribution chain between Apple and the consumer. The app, the iPhone owners purchase the apps directly from the retailer who is the antitrust violator. Uh, and that the iPhone owners uh, pay the, the overcharge directly to Apple. So the, the question was answered that uh, the people who are suing Apple do have standing because they're purchasing the app directly from, from Apple. So you have now two cases. Uh, the American Express case, which was defining a transaction uh, in the digital world. And the second case, uh, which where they decided that you're, you're actually buying the product, the app from a tech company. Okay. This is, that was the status in the United States. Now let's get to the European Union. The European Union uh, antitrust laws are, are guided by Article 101 and Article 102. And they're very similar to the antitrust provisions in, in the United States. It prohibits anti-competitive agreements and it, pro it prohibits abusive behavior by companies holding a dominant position in, in, in any market. Okay, now what drives uh, the antitrust laws in, in the EU are two acts. One is the Digital Services Act, and the Digital Services Act can be understood in a very, very simple way. Uh, what it says is that if a, if a shirt, if a name brand shirt, let's, let's call it the Prada shirt, is a fake Prada shirt is being sold offline, uh, the retailer, the brick and mortar retailer who's selling that shirt needs to remove it from the marketplace. And what is illegal offline should be also illegal online. So whoever is selling a fake name brand shirt should also on, on their online platform should also remove it from their online platform. But what is key in the European Union cases is the Digital Markets Act. And what the Digital Markets Act said, does is to define gatekeepers who provide core platform services. Now, by EU's definition, these services include online intermediation services, that is marketplaces and app stores, search engines, social networking sites, cloud services, advertising services, and more. Now, the focus, as seen by commentators, is that the Digital Markets Act uh, applies directly and is targeted to to Amazon, which has its marketplaces, to Google, which has its online search engine, and to Apple. Now, the Digital Markets Act, once again, and I'll go through this, it strengthens competition in digital markets uh, that are dominated by a few companies who serve as gatekeepers to core platform services. Now, what the Digital Market Act does is that it, it categorizes gatekeepers if they meet a certain criteria. They have a strong economic position and have a significant impact on the internal market, has a strong intermediation position, and has a durable position. Now, what stands out uh, from the European uh, laws is that it's a per se environment. If you do this, you are this. They do not seem to use a rule of reason approach. Uh, there is, if you're dominant, you, you are a gatekeeper. And if you are a gatekeeper, you have to follow certain guidelines which are laid out. Now, the problem I have with this analysis of the European Union is dominance by itself should not be bad. And just I was just before the, the meeting, as I was talking to uh, to advocate Pandey, uh, I used the example of Rafa Nadal. Uh, Rafa Nadal has dominated the French Open. He has won the French Open, I think, 14 times. Uh, is he 
is the dominance a problem? Because he is just that good on clay. He has not used any unfair advantage to become a dominant player on clay. So we now have uh, the US, uh, the European Union markets, and now let's come to India. Now, the reason why I did this in this order is the Indian uh, antitrust regime is the youngest regime. Uh, I think uh, the Competition Act was passed in 2002 and gazetted, I think, in 2009. Now, uh, before 1991, you have the Monopolies and Restrictive Trade Practices Act of 1969. And if you remember correctly, uh, we had uh, pre-1991 uh, an environment where big is bad, where there was a license raj and uh, state-owned enterprises were protected at all costs. In 2002, uh, we had the Competition Act, uh, and the language used in this Competition Act is very similar to the language used in the European Union and in the US antitrust regimes. Uh, it prohibits and anti regulates anti competitive agreements, uh, regulates abuse of dominant positions, it regulates uh, mergers, acquisitions. It also set up the Competition Commission of India and the Competition Appellate Tribunal. Okay, so the language used is very similar to the language in the text of the US laws and in the European laws. But the Indian competition authorities have, they have used a different sort of analysis uh, versus the US analysis. Uh, and the famous case for the analysis that was used is the NSC versus the M uh, MCX case. I think uh, MCX is the multi-commodity exchange. And as you all know, you have the National Stock Exchange. Now the National Stock Exchange is very, very dominant in the equity segment uh, of the stock market. I think you have BSC and uh, the NSC uh, dominating or accounting for about uh, high 90% of all trading. Now, what the National Stock Exchange did was it introduced a credit derivative segment. And the NSC granted a number of waivers uh, to participants in that, uh, in that uh, credit derivative segment. It waived transaction fees. I think it waived membership fees. Now, the CCI, the Competition Committee, said that it used uh, rule of reason analysis. It says the National Stock Exchange was dominant, and because it was dominant, uh, they asked the NSC to close down the, the credit segment, the credit derivative segment, because economic dominance resulted in abuses. Okay, uh, so this is the status of the law in in India, and these are the three laws that govern, uh, or the three antitrust regimes that govern big tech. Now, the next thing that I want to do uh, is to bring up each of these companies and see how they have been treated in the different antitrust uh, regimes that I've talked about. First is Apple. Now, Apple, the reason why I bring up Apple first is that it is a very well-integrated company. You have the Apple iPhone. Most of you have the iPad. You have the MacBook, and so from hardware, uh, brick and mortar stores, you have an app marketplace where you, uh, so this Apple is one of the most thriving, diverse, well-integrated tech company. And its, its ecosystem is, can easily be shown on this picture. It has software infrastructure, it has hardware products, it has applications and services. And uh, how do they get their revenues? Uh, they get their revenues through the app store, through music, through other verticals, including selling of iPhones uh, and MacBooks. 
uh, like I pointed out, uh, they are vertically integrated. Uh, once you are in an Apple ecosystem, all the products of, of Apple run on their operating system. But what is unique about Apple as a tech company uh, are two things. One is the ecosystem law. Once you buy an iPhone or once you buy an iPad, you are locked in into their ecosystem. It's very difficult once you're in their ecosystem to get out of that ecosystem. Number two uh, is brand ro uh, royalty. Uh, uh, I see some chat. Okay, uh, the second is brand, uh, brand loyalty. I know people who have basically everything from an iPhone uh, to an iWatch to everything in the middle. Now, what, what regulation has been faced by Apple? Uh, there are two important cases. Uh, one is the Spotify case, and the other is the Epic Games or the Fortnite case. Uh, Apple, number of cases have been brought against Apple uh, in the European Union. But I want to, to just talk specifically about Spotify and Fortnite. Uh, Spotify is a horizontal market uh, where which streams like which streams music. Now Spotify was a direct competitor to in the horizontal market of music competing with Apple Music. And what Apple did was to to uh, to prohibit Spotify from installing its app on an iPhone because it did not give Spotify the application programming interface. Uh, the second case, and this, uh, I think Apple lost this case uh, in, uh, in the European Union. The second case is uh, a particularly unique case in the United States. Uh, I think many of you know what Fortnite is. It's, it's a very, very popular game. Now, what Apple does is it charges a 30% commission and number two forces all the app developers to use the Apple payment system. Uh, Epic Games, which owns Fortnite uh, and Match Group, uh, but Match Group is still being decided in the European Union. Uh, Epic Games refused to follow the Apple, uh, the Apple rules and said uh, and directed people to other different kinds of payments. Now, Fortnite, both Spotify and Fortnite have won their cases, one in the United States and Spotify in, in the European Union. The second case, and this is the, the unique case, is Amazon. Uh, and you just look at the tremendous, incredible growth of Apple and uh, of Amazon. And you look at the Amazon, uh, fly, what I call the flyway. Uh, you have Amazon marketing services, Amazon payments, you have gaming, you have entertainment, you have retail, uh, you have cloud computing, you have Amazon private, uh, private label, you have Amazon Alexa, Fire TV. It's a huge, well-integrated market. And I'm just amazed at Amazon because at one point in time, I think in the middle 90s, Amazon was just a small bookseller. It bought and sold books online. And uh, to, uh, to fortify my argument, this is what Amazon does. It's, I call it a quasi-state. It's, it's basically everywhere, okay? Now, the e-commerce share of, of Amazon is about 40%. Uh, but what I want to focus on here is the types of sellers on Amazon and how they use their dominant position uh, to bully sellers uh, on the other side of the market. So you have Amazon retail, uh, vendors sell products to Amazon, Amazon resells it in the marketplace. So Amazon sells and fulfills its own orders. 
Then you have third party sellers. Now, the, what's important here is if there are third party sellers, who fulfills those orders? They can be fulfilled by Amazon, they can be fulfilled by the merchant, okay? Uh, or the seller fulfilled by, by crime. Now, what Amazon could do is force the third party sellers to enter into tying arrangements with Amazon as far as fulfillment of the order is concerned. There is another thing that Amazon does, uh, which can be regarded as, as anti-competitive. Uh, how many people have bought on Amazon uh, recently? If uh, you buy on Amazon, there is something called the buy box. So if there are a number of retailers who are selling the same product, there is one retailer name that shows up first. And they have paid, this retailer has paid Amazon to show up first when there is a search for that particular product. And invariably, uh, when that name shows up, 83% uh, of all Amazon sales come from buy box. So invariably you, you use the buy box, the first seller to purchase your, the item that you want. So when a shopper lands on a product detail page, Amazon chooses one seller whose detail appears in the buy box, the white box on the right-hand side. And when a customer clicks on the add to cart button, the sale goes to the seller in this box. And there is a buy box algorithm and nobody really knows how that algorithm works. But sellers pay Amazon uh, to appear in that buy box so that it can generate the sales. Okay. Now let's look at, I've, I've said this over and over again. Uh, let's look at Amazon conduct. Uh, there is bullying, like I pointed out. There is use and leveraging of data. Uh, there is tying and bundling. I talked about fulfillment. I talked about advertising. This is Amazon conduct. And Amazon has been uh, investigated uh, in the in the EU uh, and uh, also in India. I think the All India Online Vendors Association alleged that Amazon's India's wholesale arm buys goods in bulk from manufacturers and sells them to at a loss to sellers such as Cloudtail. Such sellers then offer goods on Amazon and at big discounts. Okay, so that was a case that was dealt with by the Competition Commission of India. Then the EU uh, also investigated Amazon on its use of the buy box and uh, its arrangements with the sellers uh, for fulfillment of the orders. Finally, we come to Google. And I come to Google. Google is Internet's first store. If you want to get onto, onto the Internet, the first thing that you do is you Google something. Now, Google has a plethora of products. It has Android, Chrome, Gmail, Search, Drive, Maps, Photos, YouTube, Google Play Store. But its focus, Google's focus or Alphabet's focus has always been on search. Now, there is a history uh, to Google search. Uh, internet always has the information, but the challenge always is to locate the information that people want. If you remember in the old days, you had CompuServe, which was a search engine, which was bought by AOL, and I, I don't think uh, both exist anymore. Uh, then you had the Yahoo approach to categorize websites. Uh, but what is important is Google search uh, by, uh, is the algorithmic search by Google and they use web crawling. And what do I mean by web crawling? They basically go and, and just crawl over the internet trying to figure out what the user intent is and then report the search on the search engine's reports page. 
uh, remember uh, before you had those blue links uh, and you basically click on the link and it's directed to that that web page today uh, not only the the Google search engine has improved so that you now they do a general search and they also do a thematic search. And what is a vertical or a thematic search? A vertical, so there are verticals. Uh, there is Expedia, Travelocity, uh, and the vertical search engines are advertising supported and need traffic. Google does a whole general search and because they are so good, uh, they often, and they try to determine user content, uh, user intent, uh, they display results both from the thematic search and from the universal search. Google. Uh, what is important to Google? What is important to Google here is traffic on its properties. Uh, because if nobody comes on Chrome, uh, there cannot be a Google search. Okay. So it's always about traffic acquisition costs. They have always, Google has always been dominant. Uh, there is desktop dominance. I think it, it dominates by 80, about 82% of desktop searches and about 95% of mobile searches. Uh, and they do everything to acquire, uh, foot traffic as I call it, so that people go on Chrome, and once you go on Chrome and you put in uh, a search, it automatically uses the Google search engine, so that once it uses the Google search engine, Google gets its clicks, and therefore its advertising revenue. Now, Google uh, is, uh, like I said, it's the gatekeeper of the internet. Now, it uses exclusive contracts to become the default search engine. And that is key here, to becoming the default search engine. So it makes deals with companies who control access to search engine and apps. So it makes deals with device manufacturers, browser makers, mobile carriers to become the default search engine. And, and there are other search engines. Uh, there is, I think, a search engine called DuckDuckGo. But Google, because of its monopoly power, can become a, a default search engine. Now, for example, what it did was Apple accounts for about 15% of Google smartphones. Uh, and uh, its revenues are about 8 to 12 billion. Okay. Uh, now, what Google did was paid Apple a substantial sum of money to become the default search engine on the Apple operating system. Okay. Um, it pays 12 Apple $12 billion to install Chrome on its, on its operating system. It also uses, Google also uh, uses advertising revenue. So if, for example, if you look at uh, a Times of India search page. That search uses a very often Google technology. And advertisements are placed uh, when you do a search on some of these specialized search engines. Now, Google uh, restricted rival search ads on these search engines. And the best spots were reserved for, for Google controlled ads. Now in the EU, Google was fined about one and a half billion dollars uh, for abusing its market dominance by preventing rivals from competing in online search advertising intermediation markets by imposing anti-competitive contracting risk, uh, restrictions. Okay, uh, now we have Google. I think the most famous case of Google in India is the bharatmatrimony.com case. Uh, and this case was basically Bharat Matrimony is uh, a search, uh, is a thematic search. And uh, what they alleged was that uh, Google uh, did not display its ads uh, uh, properly. 
Now, Google, uh, Google's share of the mobile search market in India from 2019 to 2021 is basically 100%. Okay, it's 99.65% uh, in June 1991. And if you look consistently, uh, it's about 95%. So Google dominates the search markets here. Uh, so there is the issue of search bias. Uh, there is an issue of having various different telephone companies install the Android operating system. And there is the issue in India of forcing uh, many of these companies to use Google Pay. Now, what I've done so far is laid out the, the antitrust regimes uh, and then saw how these tech companies come to dominate the landscape in which they are operating. What is the key to regulating big tech? One, one key is basically data. Uh, the data should be shared between everybody and data should be mobile. The second is interoperability. And what do I mean by that? Uh, an app that can be used on an Apple operating system can also be used on an Android operating system. Okay. The third and the more drastic way of regulating big tech is breaking them up. And by breaking them up, uh, I mean treating the platform as a monopoly, uh, tre treating the platform as a utility and prohibiting uh, big tech from entering into horizontal markets. Okay, uh, any questions? Can I stop the share? Thanks, Professor Manoj, sir. It was quite enlightening and informative. You have taken the case of America, antitrust, European Union, and India. Is there any question uh, is to be asked uh, from the uh, audience? Uh, Vivek, sir, there's one question from Gautam Raja Satish. Uh, this in the chat. I can't see him. Uh, okay, I can, Nid yeah. N Nidish, Nidish, please take up the questions. Yes, sir. So the question is this. Uh, considering that GPay, uh, Amazon Pay, etc., does not come under RBA regulations, is there any integrated regulatory body to oversee transactions and disputes? That's a no. question from Mr. Gautam. No, no, there is no, there is no, no body there. And 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 there, I mean, look, you have three different approaches, and I'm focusing not on the currency part of it. Okay, I'm just focusing on the competitive part of it. And there are three different regimes with three different approaches. Yes, fair enough. Anyone else? Professor Dalvi, good evening. How are you? This is Professor Nagar. Hi, Ranita. Hi, Professor. How are you? Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely amazing um, paper. What I Thank want you. What I wanted to ask was this, Prof. How did things go so far? I mean, are there any ex ante mechanisms? Um, I mean, this is not sudden or surprising. How did it build so far? That's my question. I, I mean, there there is an argument today that uh, many of these tech companies, before they enter into a business, uh, should be regulated ex ante rather than ex post. Uh, but, I mean, you look at each of these companies, they had very, very small beginnings. And it's only later that people realize how powerful they were. And uh, everybody has, is, has been locked in uh, into their various products. I mean, I can ask this, uh, the, the people who are attending here, how many people have bought on Amazon uh, in the last week? 
think practically, uh, or how many people have bought an app either on Google or on, on Apple in the last week? I mean, they have, they have, it, it's a slow creep. Uh, and, and suddenly now you realize how big it is. Uh, the attitude in the, the United States is, well, consumers are, are benefiting because of low prices on Amazon. And it's only recently, uh, I think two or three years ago, uh, that uh, a person called Lena Khan uh, came in and started arguing is no. Uh, uh, there is that illusion of cheaper prices, but Amazon is actually stifling competition. And she's currently the, the chairwoman of the Federal Trade Commission, uh, who, is, who is now overseeing uh, Amazon and Apple and, and Google. But it has been a slow uh, creep, Professor Nagar. Thank you. Thank you. Fair enough. That that lady is now the chairperson. Alina Khan is the chairwoman. Alina, Alina Khan, Alina Khan. And her article, I would, uh, the antitrust, uh, I think it's uh, Amazon. It's Lena Khan, uh, I think Yale Law Journal. I don't remember the year, 2017 or 2018. And it's an amazingly well-written article when she was a student. How you appreciate his position on antitrust? Pardon? How you appreciate her position on antitrust? Uh, because, I mean, <laughs> it is rather, rather interested. Uh, antitrust has always interested me. And I was in the old, uh, there is an article on, on Google by somebody called uh, Geeta Gauri and Michael Salinger. If, if uh, you can, you can read that article. Uh, I was always interested in, in antitrust. Uh, and uh, that was old antitrust. Antitrust went to sleep for the last 30 years, and suddenly she revived it. And as Professor Nagar says, that during the time when antitrust was asleep to the time uh, when Lena Khan uh, wrote that article, uh, basically nobody really cared and these tech giants grew bigger and bigger. Before that uh, talk began, we were discussing on that bill, uh, the forthcoming bill. But there is no bill. Wait, there is no, no bill in the United States yet. Uh, I mean, there are individual attempts to introduce bills, but there okay. is no formal regulation in the United formal, States. There is no formal regulation. Uh, there is no formal regulation supported by the president. Uh, whereas there is formal uh, formal laws, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act in the EU. European Union. The Euro European Union. So these are the private bills. Those are coming uh, in in the US. They are private bills. Yes. yes. Any other question, uh, uh, moderator? I do have a question. If I can go forward. Uh, yes, yes. Please proceed, uh, Professor Manoj. Uh, this question uh, is in continuance to your argument that the development of ecosystem by each of these tech giants is baffling to a level. Uh, there is this other side of the arguments or even a complementary argument that comes along with this uh, is the denial of a right to repair or right to modify any of this um, goods or technology that we buy from these tech chains. So that also has been uh, a vital argument that is going against these tech chains because they are not letting you repair the very objects you buy from them. Either you have to throw it out or you have to reach out to them again to renew it for a much higher cost. So no. uh, what is your idea, idea on the denial of right to repair or modify by these tech giants that is contributing to the antitrust? Okay, now, so what is to, your- to, to repair what? The hardware product? Yeah, the hardware products. The for example, buy an iPhone. Or, yeah. or to modify the app. Yes. Uh, what are you, what, 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 what should you the focus questions. on? The, the, hardware the, product, the hardware product, the iPhone or the iPad, or is it, uh, is it modifying the app that you buy? No, no. The... I'm speaking about the hardware products, the iPhone, the iPad, the, the Echoes the, and all that. The, the iPhone lasts forever. I mean, very honestly, 
But what what Apple does is it continues to add new features to the to the operating system. Okay, uh, now what is the difference between an iPhone 8 and an iPhone 13? In reality, just a better camera and maybe a faster chip. But the attitude is, okay, you have a phone for two years and you throw it out and nobody really cares. Okay, I mean, and and that's a very, hardware is a very small part of the revenue. Most of the revenue of these guys comes from uh, the apps uh, and from, from the searches. Uh, Any other questions, guys? Silo, Silo, the objective you... of consumer welfare and I didn't get the last part. I, I have a question. I just read it out. So, do you think in this area there is a conflict between two objectives of antitrust law? First of all, the focus on consumer welfare, and secondly, regulation of competition. So. Uh, does it seem at times that the regulators themselves are conflicted about which objective they need to focus on? No, the, the focus should always be on consumer welfare. Uh, I mean, and India, I mean, uh, th that's that's been my position all, all through. It, it's always consumer welfare. And maybe the, the, the Indian authorities, and th this has been brought out by, by Dr. Gauri, that the Indian authorities are kind of conflicted uh, between consumer welfare and protecting... Uh, uh, what I call indigenous uh, enterprises, but her attitude and the attitude of everybody is consumer welfare. And even Lina Khan is consumer welfare. The, the, but uh, the disagreement is, uh, is about the remedies. Uh, how do you rein in big tech? And the Supreme Court, as I said, I mean, they, the Supreme Court of the United States has not really dealt with this issue. And I don't think that the Indian Supreme Court was, has also uh, had cases on uh, on high tech and the platform economy. No, it's not there. It's on cartel and also on so forth. Right. Any other question? Right. I have Professor, a question. Professor, Professor Manoj Dalvi, uh, you're, from, you're from India. Yes, and, I'm from Bombay. Yes, uh, you're from Bombay. Uh, it may, it may, it may uh, appears to be a little silly to ask you, but I have, I have one thing to ask you. In this Diwali, what happened in India? I observed very keenly on that. Uh, Diwali is a festival where uh, people have a lot of buying. Mm. People right. buy a lot of uh, in Diwali festival. A lot of people buy a lot of things. The market is. Bullish during this four five days of Diwali right. festival. What happened uh, this time in Diwali? There was a lot of uh, uh, e-purchase, and uh, everybody now and then are uh, placing orders through Amazon. Like it, it, exactly my point. I mean, I asked that question: How many people have bought on Amazon? Uh -huh. So what I am telling you. Uh, there is a TV TV segment. Uh, we have LG, Samsung, and so uh, four five good uh, Sony and all that. There is one MI TV. MI, uh, MI is a brand. MI TV. Amazon has uh, offered that uh, on a very cheaper side, somewhere around fifty percent off, something like that. So sales of all the other brand went down, and MI was uh, sailing through Amazon like anything. So lot of dealers on on various goods. They were virtually shutting their uh, uh, shops and uh, they are fed up with this uh, Amazon phenomena. This Diwali, India felt it like anything. So basically, you're you're making the point that uh, uh, that that I made. I mean, it's entering into a horizontal market on its platform, and what I call is Sherlocking. So they are imitating the products of LG and other companies. And then selling it at a very very high discount. But vigilance so, vigilance here here in India is not that much as appears to be in, in right. US or Europe. What do you feel on this count? Because I mean I I don't know the the procedure involved because I've forgotten uh, this civil procedure laws. 
Uh, but yes. uh, and and the the procedure involved for filing a complaint with this uh, the competition commission. But maybe somebody should file a complaint against uh, this occurrence with whoever is involved. And I, I don't think you might have the standing, uh, but uh, say a company that has shut down its business because of uh, the selling by Amazon of these 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 TV products, maybe they have the standing to to file complaints or or a vendors association may, may they may have a sta standing to file complaints against the Amazon platform. But doesn't, isn't Flipkart and Walmart also have platforms in India? They have, they have, they have. But and Amazon is a fan. In fact, my my own book, which is which was selling for 500 rupees on Amazon in during, during the Diwali time, it was somewhere 200 rupees. So even <laughs> the discount was so huge in the Diwali time that so some possibly some will come 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 up and do that uh, judicial exercise with the competition commission professor one last uh, thought you know the regulation the 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 solutions that you suggest don't you think that will face huge resistance from this giant and huge of inhibitions from the government of course they will uh, of, of course they will uh but uh, there was resistance historically uh, all from from big big corporations in the 1970s and 1970s and 1980s, uh, Standard Oil Corporation was one of the big antitrust cases, which were broken up. Uh, AT and T more recently in the 70s and 80s, and and there was big uh, big resistance. Uh, but uh, the the focus should not be on on just breaking it up. The focus should be on what do they have dominance and do they use their dominance? So all the four elements that I talked about in the rule of reason, they should be used. And I don't know whether the way to go about it is through passing new laws or giving more power to the Competition Commission of India uh, to, to take action against uh, violators of antitrust or, or, or companies that are monopolizing. Thank you very much. Okay. We will take last question by Mohammad Azad. Uh, one question. Mohammad, you are there? Uh, yes, I am here, sir. You may proceed. We will take this last question and then we will go. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thanks to Professor Manoj Dalvi for this very enlightening presentation. So my doubt is, as you have rightly pointed out that these tech giant companies have grown really big slowly and they cause universal competition issues because uh, many cases have been filed in India, in US, in Germany, almost in every other nation. So in your opinion, how to create a level playing field and ensure that even the most powerful tech giant companies play by the same rules just like any other smaller companies? I have also typed my question in the chat box for your reference. Can you, can you uh, see, uh, level playing field in in each country, or or as taking these three uh, geographical regions as one? Uh, so it can an opinion can be in respect of either each country or even taking all three regions together, sir. I mean, there are there, there the antitrust under Lena Khan. Uh, they have they have started looking very seriously at the conduct of Amazon and Apple. Uh, Fortnite was an individual case that that's the Epic Games case, uh, where uh, uh, where I think Apple lost part of it, uh, part of that case. So it can be done uh, through individuals uh, if they have the standing, uh, and it can be done by the competition authorities in in the various different countries. Okay, so thank you, sir. Okay. Very well. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for being with us and having this enlightening talk uh, with us, Professor Manoj, sir. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, the association and the Tamil Nadu National Law University in this conference. Uh, I hope, I suppose uh, uh, we, we can uh, end uh, this session.
Nitesh is anything and else is remain to transit? No, sir. No, sir. We can end the session with uh, thanking everyone who is present there. Thank, thank you to everyone. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Professor Talvi. Soon we will see you on some other forum, some other right. talk. Thank you so much. And you will enlighten us again. Thank you, Mrs. Nagar, Prasad, sir, and Thomas Flix. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, sir. Have, 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 have a good dinner Professor and good night. Bye. Bye. No, sir. Good. Yes. You good, good night. Me? Good night. Uh, I suppose there's a morning. Yes, it is morning. Yes. Oh, so, so good morning to you. Have a good breakfast. We will have a good okay. dinner. Uh, okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, enjoy your dinners. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you.